Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Hagen. I'm a professor from practice at Georgetown Law and a director of the Sovereign Debt Forum, which is sponsoring this webinar. As many of you know, the Sovereign Debt Forum is a collaborative effort among Georgetown Law, Queen Mary's London, and the University, uh, the European University Institute. Um, many, among many other things, we organize regular webinars that cover the most topical issues in the area of sovereign debt. And I think we can all agree that the common framework is indeed topical. Uh, when it was announced by the G20 in 2020, many of us saw it as a game changer. But more than two and a half years on, there are real concerns on implementation. To say that progress has been slow is a bit of an understatement. Of the three countries that have sought treatment under the common framework, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, none have actually seen their debt restructure. And this slow pace comes at a time when, at least according to the fund, almost two thirds of low income countries face debt distress. With the economic dislocation caused by the pandemic being exacerbated by rising interest rates, energy prices, and an appreciating dollar. Not surprisingly, <laughs> there is no shortage of opinions as to what the problems are and how to fix them. Many critics start with China, although it agreed to join the common framework. And indeed, that is what made the announcement of the common framework such a breakthrough. Is China really ready to provide debt relief needed to restore debt sustainability? Relatedly, is the international community using all of the tools available to create incentives for creditors to participate? A particular importance in this regard is the IMS lending policy, including its financing assurances policy and its lending into arrears policy. Fingers also point to the absence of clarity on timelines and uncertainty that surrounds the application of the principle of comparable treatment which as many of you know, was an important feature of the common framework that was imported from the, uh, from the Paris Club. Now, in fairness to the common framework, its first cases have not been easy ones. Ethiopia is plagued by a long run, running civil war. In the case of Chad, the process is complicated by the fact that the single largest private creditor has enormous leverage by virtue of the rather unique structure of its claim. And finally, I would note in fairness, there are signs of movement. The recent approval of the IMF supported program for Zambia was based on the receipt of financing assurances from the relevant creditor committee that adequate progress was being made with respect to the debt restructuring process. And all of these issues have relevance beyond the common framework. Many of these issues confronting low-income countries, including, for example, the changing composition of official creditors, are also confronting middle-income emerging markets who are not technically eligible for the common framework. So should the common framework be viewed as a pilot for all sovereign debtors, a sort of Paris Club 2.0? To make sense of all of the opinions out there, we brought together a group of individuals who have very informed ones. In some cases, based on their own firsthand experience in the debt restructuring process. And they will be introduced by our moderator, Professor Anna Gelpern, my friend and colleague at Georgetown Law, and one of the real academic thought leaders in this area. Anna, over to you. Sean, thank you so much, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, and indeed, thanks most of all to our panelists. So we're going to uh, start with Guillaume Chabert, who is now the Deputy Director of Strategy Policy and Review Department at the IMF. Um, and of course, before then, he, he is no stranger to the debt world, shall we say he was uh, uh, in uh, a number of leading positions in at the French finance ministry and uh, 
in particular, certainly dealing with a lot of the issues we're going to be discussing um, in the Paris Club context, uh, followed by our dear friend and another founding director. The Sovereign Debt Forum has a lot of founding directors. <laughs> success and its many founders, uh, but Lee really stands out among them. Um, and he, his official titles uh, are a uh, visiting professorial fellow at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at um, uh, Queen Mary. Uh, he's also honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh Law School, but of course he's really the dean of this sovereign debt uh, practice and academic universe, certainly when it comes to um, the law of sovereign debt, and he will follow Guillaume. Um, after Lee, um, we have uh, Reza Bakir, who is now uh, the senior fellow at the uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, but he has just recently left his position as the governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. And he will, um, of course, he has a unique vantage point as well um, on uh, in particular, the common framework, DSSI, um, as uh, Pakistan uh, had a prominent role in that process. And, and before then, like the other panelists, uh, he has a rich, uh, he has had a rich life in the world of sovereign debt in uh, more places than I could list. Um, and uh, closing out, we're going to have Elena Duger, who's the chair of Macroeconomic Board Managing Director and uh, Chief Credit Officer for the Americas. Just for the Americas, Elena? I thought it was everybody. Um, at Moody's. And again, she is uh, an expert in this field uh, and uh, will share our wisdom both from the market perspective and on the unique role of the uh, credit uh, rating agencies in particular, um, as well as the macroeconomic environment that we are living through. Now, um, here's how we're going to go about this. Um, Lee and Guillaume will, I think everybody turn on your cameras. Um, we are going to start with Guillaume, followed by Lee, Reza, and Elena. Um, we would love to have your questions at the Q&A tab, please. Um, we are going to spend the first 25 minutes or so um, really with opening comments, focusing on what is the common framework in context and where exactly is it? Um, and then we're going to transition to the wither part, um, which I think has some directionality to it. And in particular, we're gonna talk about um, common framework as a model um, for the evolution of this uh, sovereign debt universe at this critical moment. Um, and now I will fall completely quiet except for keeping time. I will try to be very disciplined about that and um, hand it over to Guillaume. Uh, thank you all so very much. And um, I look forward to an exciting discussion. Uh, thank you, Anna, Sean, uh, for inviting me uh, to this event. Very, very uh, important and very appreciated. Briefly, I wanted to touch upon three questions. First, what is a common framework and what it is not? Second, does it deliver or does it not deliver? And third, uh, what needs to be fixed, if anything? Or should we replace basically the common framework entirely with something else? And I know I have uh, only five minutes and I spent uh, a lot in technical issues, so sorry about that. First question, what is a CF and what it is not? Well, we all know that it's an agreement between official bilateral creditors from the G20 and the Paris Club in November 2020. Sean, it was not two and a half years uh, 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 ago. Huh? It was even not two years ago. So it's very recent. Huh? Let's not forget that. It's not even two years. Um, so it's an agreement between official bilateral creditors from the G20 and Price Club to uh, agree to jointly address requests for debt restructuring who would emanate from uh, countries in a list of 73 countries that were eligible in 2020 to the DSSI. So key point, it's only official bilateral creditors. It's official bilateral creditors led. It's not an IMF led process. It's led by the uh, official bilateral creditors, which was meant to address one specific issue that uh, was identified as a key failure 
in the depth restructuring architecture all through the 2010s, which was a divide between price club and non-price club creators, mainly China, India, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. So that's one key element. It's creator-led, it's case-by-case -case approach. It's not at all top uh, 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 down approach like HIPIC was. There's not a list of countries with targeted debt relief that uh, would be meant to be achieved. That's not at all the point. It's really a bottom up, uh, completely case-by-case -case, with a few rules that are very important. That relief had to be provided in the context of an IMF program, a UCT quality type of program. Um, the IMF World Bank DSA is meant to be, you know, the uh, uh, tool to assess the restructuring envelope that is needed to restore debt sustainability. And there are in the common framework, the uh, typically uh, Paris Club-like uh, rules to assess comparability of treatments for uh, the private creators and the other official vital creators. So a lot of flexibility, not many rules, um, indeed very much uh, like the price club, but we can come back to that at a later stage. It's not price club 2.0, I don't think so. Um, so now implementation is key, and we've seen over time the uh, common framework create, generate, you know, through the different cases, its set of rules in terms of implementation. And I will come back to that at some point, but we've seen the case of Zambia dealt with completely different from what the case of Chad uh, uh, had been implemented, for instance, with very early engagement with the uh, country authorities on the data side, very early engagement with the private creators, and a process that went much uh, better in terms of involvement of China in the process compared to what we've seen in the uh, first case. Second question, does it deliver or not? Um, here also, I just wanted Sean to mention that the number of low-income countries that we assess at high risk or in debt distress is actually a bit below 60%. We always say 60%, it's a bit below 60%, so it's not too third. Just to, <laughs> it's not a disaster. We are, we are not in a sovereign debt crisis in the low-income country uh, sphere, huh? just to, 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 to mention that. Um, I think I was meant to mention the status of implementation of the three country cases that uh, have implemented the uh, debt restructuring under the common framework. So uh, Sean alluded to that already. Chad, just to mention, the Creator Committee was formed two months after the request, early 2021. Financing assurances were delivered very rapidly thereafter in June 2021. Just to mention that it was the first case, the first case ever in the entire history of the fund where China provided financing assurances to the fund for us to be able to land. So in terms of breakthrough, we have also to put this thing into historic perspective. Huh? And Dambia is the only second case we have uh, uh, so far, where, where China provided financing assurances to the fund. What went wrong indeed with Chad, or what took a lot of time, was indeed not China, but Glencore, all trader, collateralized financing processes. Chad cannot run a real vis a vis Glencore, so the lending insurer policy of the fund just doesn't work uh, because Chad cannot run a real. Um, Zambia. Um, uh, uh, as we know, we could approve, our board could approve the program for Zambia uh, at the end of August. Um, the staff level agreement was reached on the 3rd of December 2021, so it's definitely too long. Uh, but in terms of architecture, processes, etc., it's more or less conformed to the textbook that you would like to have, with the private creators working in parallel of the official bilateral creators, everyone knowing the rules, comparability of treatment is clear, and it's moving forward. Ethiopia, as Sean mentioned, there is, of course, a difficult uh, situation on the ground, which makes things uh, uh, very complex. So again, I could <laughs> elaborate more, but just wanted to mention that we've seen over the three, four months, a complete change in terms of imp real implementation, daily work of China working with France in the co-chairing of the uh, uh, Creator Committee of uh, Zambia, as well as Ethiopia, for instance, with China, you know, much more active in putting uh, documents on the table, in shaping the uh, way the meetings are organized, in, of course, domestically having the coordination processes that has been on the table for years, I think, in terms of uh, uh, splitting different uh, the decision making among different agencies. All of this is moving. Not to say that we are there yet, for sure not, but it's moving. There is a momentum. So third, what needs to be fixed and should we move to something else? I think you know, there is a world of the desirable and there's a world of the realities. I think for decades now, there have been thinking of a possible international treaty on that sovereign debt resolution. This is not really happening. We don't see any momentum for that. 
and not the least in the context of huge political fragmentation in the world. So uh, 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 would a common framework agreement uh, like the one found by the G20 in November 2020 even be thinkable today? It's not sure. So reopening the discussion might not be you know, the, the first best we would like to have, uh, but there are fixes indeed that need to be fixes. I mean, issues that need to be fixed, that, that need to be fixed under the common framework currently. One is the processes. Sean is very right, it takes too long. So something, something has to be done to accelerate, in particular, the first phase uh, once a request is being made. Second, there is an issue, what do we do with countries that are not on the list of the 73 countries? Here, it's a question of creditor composition. You know, emerging markets are mainly oriented towards private creditors, Paris club creditors to some extent, but we don't have massively a problem of coordination among official bilateral creditors in the emerging market sphere. There are a few cases. Sri Lanka comes to mind. Suriname comes to mind. And reversely, in the list of 73 countries, you would find countries where the debt composition is not that much geared towards official bilateral creditors, but much more private creditors. So this frontier is absurd. Uh, what needs to be fixed is official creditor coordination. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, common framework or any name uh, uh, of the like would work. Um, but we have an issue with Sri Lanka, for instance. Now, um, uh, another issue is what do we do on the private sector side? Because we don't talk that much about the private sector, but the private sector is it's scattered itself. You know, we used to work with the IIF and banks, but coordination between banks and bondholders is not that easy. What do we do with all traders? What do we do with community backed uh, loans? Um, do we have anywhere a standing kind of forum where we can have technical discussion among the official bilateral creators, the banks, the bondholders, the oil traders, the IFIs, and the debtor countries in the first place? I don't think we have. So that's where indeed some progress could be done. But my message would be fix what needs to be fixed, but let's be realistic about the international situation. Let me stop here. Over to you, Anna. Um, thank you so much, Guillaume. So, Lee, you heard it. The common framework is the common framework. It is a new endeavor, and we should not reopen it. And um, the one thing that actually really struck me that I hope you might address is I was looking at the 1980s um, just for no good reason, um, not that anything reminds me of them, um, and it took a really long time to solve domestic problems in creditor countries in particular. Um, so whenever we talk about the 1980s, we talk about the Brady Bonds and the magic bullet that solved it all. But it really took a very long and winding road there. And um, are we asking too much of the common framework, perhaps? Okay, Anna, uh, uh, thank you and wonderful to be with you. Let me try to set this discussion in a bit of historical context. In the last quarter of the 20th century, a sovereign debtor needing debt relief could look forward to negotiating with two groups of creditors. It's bilateral creditors and it's commercial creditors, either commercial banks or starting in the 1990s, bondholders. The former negotiated jointly under the auspices of the Paris Club. The commercial creditors, whether banks or bondholders, typically formed representative creditor negotiating committees, and that's how the process went forward. It changed in this century because non-Paris Club bilateral creditors, principally China, became the dominant bilateral source of funding for emerging market countries. China is not a member of the Paris Club. It observes at the Paris Club, but is not a member of the club and is not bound by the club, by the club's decisions. Moreover, uh, China has shown a predilection for ad hoc, bespoke sovereign debt uh, restructurings coupled with an almost obsessive concern with confidentiality about the terms of those debt restructurings. What this has done is inject a degree of, or not inject, it has aggravated the suspicions that always 
plagued this uh, 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 business, which is that different creditor groups fear that others are stealing a march on them, uh, that others are bearing, are, are getting more lenient restructuring terms. So the bilateral creditors don't wish to see uh, their debt relief simply being used to subsidize bondholders. Bondholders feel the same way about their debt relief. China does not wish to see its debt relief going into the pockets of hedge fund managers in Mayfair or Greenwich, Connecticut. The United States does not want to see its debt relief being used to service Chinese Belt and Road Initiatives loan. It's, it is a very suspicious process. And when you moved from a negotiating framework that involved simply Paris Club and commercial creditor representative committees, and you added the non-Paris Club bilaterals, China, it became three-dimensional chess. And that, the fact that no one wished to move unless they could be sure that the other groups were providing comparable debt relief, that injected a degree of arthritis into the process. Why? Because if any of them dragged their feet, the entire process bogged down. November 2020. The G20 announces the common framework. On its face, the common framework promised to facilitate this process. How? The answer was to bring all bilateral creditors, both Paris Club and non-Paris Club, at a joint negotiating table. That was an innovation and an important one. Uh, they would then negotiate debt relief for the country. And then as the bilaterals saw it, uh, the country would leave that negotiation under a requirement to seek comparable debt uh, concessions from its commercial creditors. That was how it was supposed to go. As we've discussed, and, and uh, I think we will discuss the reasons for it. It hasn't worked out quite that way. Uh, there still is a degree of arthritis in the process. Uh, it wasn't that the common framework cured the arthritis. It was rather that the common framework seemed uh, to be infected by it. Uh, whether that is uh, to be laid at the feet of China solely, I'm not entirely sure. I agree with Guillaume that each of the three countries that have availed themselves of the common framework are special cases. And there are good reasons why uh, it has been difficult to move forward and conclude packages. Uh, but I don't think the arthritic character of this business has been uh, wholly cured by the common framework, uh, but perhaps it will be uh, as we all get used to operating under this new system. I'll stop there, Anna. We thank you very much. And you know what? If need be, we will have part two and part three. We have some really excellent questions in the Q&A, so um, after the first round, we may jump to those. Um, but Reza, we really need your help here, particularly with all the medical metaphors um, for uh, economic crises and debt restructuring processes. Uh, please help. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Anna. Good morning and good afternoon. Good evening to everybody who's joined. Let me begin by thanking you, Anna, and Sean for the invitation to be here with you. I'm really honored to be in the company of such giants of sovereign debt, and I hope I can contribute uh, with, uh, with my views. And I should explain my views come from two primary perspectives. One, as a former governor of a central bank in a country with a high debt burden. And second, from my previous experience at the IMF, including for four years heading 
the debt policy division and doing some uh, work on IMF policies towards debt restructuring with Sean and others. Now, I want to preface at the very beginning that all of my views should please be taken as solely my own personal views, not representing or suggesting anything about what Pakistan's current situation is. Now, I fully agree with what Guillaume has said and Lee as well about the innovation that the common framework represented. I think at the outset, we should appreciate the staff and management of the IMF and the World Bank for pushing to put something together when there was no coordinating mechanism. I think my goal today is to discuss what are some of the ways in which we can move forward. And for that, it is important to identify what are at least in the perception of an ex official of a high debt country, some of the issues. I'd like to point out three. And the first has to do with the following question. As a um, ex-central bank governor, and if I was to put my shoes, myself in the shoes of a current finance minister or a central bank governor of a high debt country that are considering coming to the fund and using uh, the common framework to move forward, does the current experience with the common framework and does the current perception of the common framework inspire confidence for such a finance minister? My thinking uh, is that at present, and this may be partly or primarily a perception issue, that it does not. And it has to do with the facts and the experience to date, notwithstanding, as Guillaume has mentioned, that these three cases may be unique, but it has taken a long time, and the process in each case has been quite varied. So if I put myself in the shoes of a finance minister who is dealing with a high debt in her country and has to go and explain to her or his prime minister that, sir, I think we should go ahead with a treatment or a program with the IMF under the common framework, but I do not know how long it will take for us to come out of our current uh, default-like situation. And I do not know what the process will entail, particularly with bilateral creditors. And sir, I also do not know if along the way we will end up um, affecting badly or uh, creating ill will among some of these new bilateral official creditors that have been nice to us recently because they may not have full ownership in the process. All of these uncertainties, I think to me right now suggest that in the minds of a current finance minister or central bank governor, there are likely a lot of concerns about embracing the fund early to move through this. Now, some of the points that Guillaume has mentioned and some of the points that were laid out in a blog by the head of SPR, Jela, I think late 2021, that will go towards defining some of the modalities, timeline, processes, I think will help in this regard because it will give some more clarity and certainty to such officials when they have to decide whether to go forward with using the common framework. But in the meantime, we do have a problem. And the problem is that these uncertainties and the perception of it not inspiring confidence is going to cause a delay. I think in this situation, finance ministers, central bank governors are not going to go with the pitch to a prime minister saying, let's jump at this. And what this means is more debt overhang. And if in the end, this debt overhang does require a restructuring, it means that the magnitude of the problem has grown over this period because of the delay. So that's my point number one about whether the current framework and its perception is inspiring confidence amongst the would-be takers. My second point has to do with um, how effective the common framework is with the holdout problem. I want to take a step back and uh, mention that a lot, a goal in a lot of such approaches to debt restructurings is to effectively deal with non-cooperating creditors, whether in the private sector or bilateral official creditors. And in the examples to date, we see that it has taken some time, whether it is because of non-cooperation of a private creditor, or if it has taken time 
to get all of the bilateral creditors, including the current major bilateral creditors, to come on the same table. In the meantime, the fund has not been able to move forward in resolving the debt distress situation. The fund's arrears policies, both with respect to private creditors as well as with respect to official creditors, one of their goals was to provide an incentive structure such that we overcome this cooperation problem. And my question really is whether the current common framework as it is, is effectively dealing with that problem or are the multilateral institutions essentially beholden to uh, the private or, and or bilateral official creditors in this context? The new tools in the funds arrears policy towards official creditors, it's a question whether they have been used to the extent they could have or they have not. This is related to the first point because if a finance minister feels that there are problems that the fund may not be able to address itself, then its confidence in working with the fund towards a resolution is undermined. And it's important, in my view, therefore to discuss how effective the current common framework is in addressing those issues. And my last point is simply, how do we then get more ownership? And by ownership, I mean ownership of the fund, ownership of the World Bank in the common framework. There are some issues that get mentioned in, um, uh, by uh, experts in the discussions of the common framework. Um, but it is unclear what, if any, are the solutions. And some of these are, for instance, the role of the Paris Club itself. Um, are the new creditors, do they have as much ownership in it? I, when I used to go to the Paris Club and represent the IMF, this is several, several years ago. Even then, the Paris Club was talking about bringing China into the Paris Club. Well, still, China's not in the Paris Club, we have the common framework. But the fact that it's not, and the fact that some other major creditors are not, does suggest some issues on the minds of such creditors. And it would be useful to discuss how do we move beyond that. And my second main comment with regards to some of the outstanding issues is also what to do with the multilateral development banks. One of the issues, as I understand it, that has come up particularly with, uh, with the current major bilateral creditors is, do they share or, or deal with the entire burden on their own? Or is their burden sharing together with multilateral development banks? Not so much the IMF, but multilateral development banks. And in that case, how does one deal with the preferential status of such creditors that has historically been something that has been assumed. Um, I think it's important perhaps to uh, see if as part of generating ownership in the membership of the common framework, these issues can be discussed in a very, uh, in a constructive way. So in summary, Anna, my three points are one, working that at least in perception, the common framework inspires confidence in the minds of would-be finance ministers, central bank governors considering using it. That uh, thinking about it, dealing effectively uh, with generating cooperation amongst official and private creditors so that we don't have a holdout type problem. And finally, what is some of the discussion that we need to do uh, to generate ownership, particularly amongst the new bilateral official creditors? Thank you. Reza, thank you very much. And lest anybody wonders, I do not consider myself a failed moderator for letting everyone uh, exceed their time, because I think that what has been said has been extremely valuable. So what we're going to do is after Elena brings us home, and in particular, Elena, I wanted to uh, tease out one point that uh, Reza, uh, that uh, was sort of mentioned, but might have been lost in Reza's remarks, and that is, um, uh, you know, after the debt restructuring, there's another day and there are, you know, profound financing needs in many of these countries. And how do we situate the restructuring process in that broader 
and the common framework in particular in the broader context of financing urgent development needs investment and you know in the current macroeconomic environment and certainly the uh market finance and uh rating agency perspectives are very important here um I'm, we're not going to do a second round. What we're going to do is um, after Ellen uh, uh, offers her remarks, I will summarize some of the terrific questions we've had, and then the panel can do some combination of answering the questions and commenting on one another, because I think that um, that's probably as that's probably more realistic than uh uh, monopolizing the discussion for ourselves. Um, so, Elena, thank you so much, and please bring us home and solve all the problems. Always happens, <laughs> but we don't. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Thank you all for having me on the panel, and thank you all for joining us this morning. I'll, I'll address two questions. I'll put a little bit the macro and market context within which the common framework discussion is taking place and uh, kind of drive home the point why, why this discussion is extremely timely. And then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, coming from a rating agency perspective, talk a little bit about uh, kind of what happens to ratings around debt restructurings. And I'll make a couple of points there where I felt that sometimes the role of ratings is slightly misunderstood in, in, that, uh, in that context. So let me, let me take a step back and kind of frame the, the uh, credit environment. And uh, we are using the turn of the cycle as the headline for, for our uh, kind of meteor credit conditions outlook update. And it's meant to capture the fact that the credit environment has turned. We are looking at quite challenging uh, sovereign and generally global credit conditions for the next two years. So we are, we are looking at an environment of, of elevated inflation, high interest rates, lower growth, less supportive external environment in terms of lower trade flows. And we are also looking at uh, tighter financial conditions, tighter liquidity, and a lot of uncertainty in, uh, in the environment, which will translate into financial markets volatility, which for sovereigns in turn would mean stop and go market episodes of stop and go market access for, for spec rate uh, credits. So very uh, challenging environment going forward. We do expect that to translate into uh, a higher sovereign default rate over the next two years. So we don't expect a widespread emerging markets debt crisis, so nothing of that of that magnitude, but we do think that we will see more sovereign defaults over the next couple of years. And we already have five defaults in 2022. So the, we usually, the, the typical sovereign default count is one to two a year. We had a spike in 2020 on the back of the coronavirus shock. Uh, we had six defaults in 2020. There was one default last year only, and we are already looking at five, five defaults uh, so far in 2022. So quite challenging, quite challenging credit environment, which makes, again, this conversation uh, very, very, very uh, timely. The a couple I wanted to address the question. So coming from a rating perspective, I wanted to address a little bit of questions of what happens to ratings around the debt restructuring because there are aspects to this which I think uh, there's some confusion around this and how people think about this in the official in the official uh, sector discussions for for sovereigns ratings normally. So credit ratings reflect the. Uh, capacity and willingness of governments to repay debt. So they refer very narrowly to debt repayment capacity. Credit ratings normally come down as credit stress increases. They are normally on the bottom of the rating scale, usually in the, for Moody's in the CAA, C space, way before the restructuring event occurs. So we're talking about a year or more before we get to kind of a severe debt crisis or a debt restructuring event. Ratings tend to stay, not tend, they stay low, Leading up to the debt restructuring, as they reflect the higher, the higher risk, the high risk of default, and the expectations of losses for investors. Now, upon the completion of the debt restructuring, and if you normally have a, a debt exchange, exchange, the old bonds along with their ratings are withdrawn. The new bonds come into market. They're newly rated and they're re-rated on a forward-looking basis. So we're looking at debt repayment capacity three to five year out on the new debt 
And that, that new rating, take, or new assessment of the rating, takes into account the benefits of the debt restructuring. It takes into account debt relief that comes on the back of the debt restructuring. It takes into account a relief in debt servicing costs that normally comes on the back of a debt restructuring, along with the forward-looking view uh, in terms of economic trajectory and fiscal policy trajectory and debt trajectory for, for the economy. So the, the reason I'm going over this is a lot of, and I'll, I'll leave you kind of with a thought on this, a lot of the discussion around the common framework was focused on what happens to the ratings in, in the time of the debt restructuring. And in the typical case, nothing happens to the rating during the debt restructuring. Ratings just indicate that default is occurring. What really matters from a public policy perspective is what happens after the debt restructuring. And the decision to participate or not should be the cost-benefit analysis. You know, do the benefits of the debt restructuring outweigh, outweigh the cost? And I think that's that's quite, you know, um, and again, the rating is an input in that decision, but it's not the answer. The answer has to be the cost benefit analysis of the debt restructuring. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here. Oh, well, thank you so very much. Um, and uh, so am I, uh, this is a clarification question. Am I right that you could have a debt restructuring that is perceived as not deep enough or not comprehensive enough to solve the debt problem. And the cause of, let's say, the persistent low rating would not be the fact of the restructuring, but the fact that it wasn't deep enough or it wasn't, it didn't solve the problem. In many cases, I think last last time we were, uh, kind of we updated our study around what happens around debt levels and, and debt relief around defaults. In many cases, I think there was some debt relief. In many cases, there was no debt relief around the debt restructuring. There was destruction sort of on the margin where countries emerge with still very high debt levels and a lot of, uh, and, and still kind of a lot of uh, banking sector problems and external vulnerability, which remains high. So the rating kind of trajectory remains low after, after the, the default. Thank you so much. Um, so let me summarize the couple of buckets of questions that we've gotten, and then why don't we go around um, uh, uh, go around the table? And if I've um, hopefully I will not have missed um, uh, major threads. So there is a, a a set of questions that really revolve around comparability and how it's assessed. Um, and as well as um, how the fund looks at uh, uses what how it approaches the problem of uh, you know what the right discount rate is in this interest rate environment, right? And I think broadly this kind of brings together questions of uh, sustainability and comparability. Um, and uh, Guillaume, that. Some of these were addressed directly to you, but I think it's it's probably you first refusal. Um, and then uh, the there are a number of questions that have to do with uh, um, how do you secure enough relief? So the too little as well as the too late uh, problem. Um, and more broadly, how uh, the common framework fits in the rest of the architecture of the debt restructuring architecture. And then um, uh, what? how does that architecture itself has to might have to change as a result of the common framework uh, with China and other countries that had not been on uh, part of the uh, uh, restructuring architecture before uh, that are now uh, on board and really central to the success of um, uh, of the enterprise. Um, other questions have to do with uh, transparency, the perennial concern, and really there, I think, lest we end up with transparency is good, we should really try to define our terms. There is the you know, incentives um, to overcome the confidentiality, the sort of the gravitational pull of this confidentiality um, policies, but also, uh, you know, who is the constituency, right? So um, to whom is the information uh, disclosed? Um, 
as far as incentives go, um, the role of the IMF's lending into arrears policy, but uh, really, I think what uh, Guillaume, your your point about and Lee's point about um, Glencore is vital. I think I think they're financing structures, and uh, there will be others that work around these policies. So how do we get to comprehensive reach and adjusting the incentives um, as the uh, as the credit landscape changes. Um, OK, I think that's about the bucket and uh, the questions keep coming. Um, how about we just start with Guillaume and um, Guillaume, Lee, Reza, and uh, Elena, and then um, Sean, you can do a two-fingered intervention um, if the spirit moves you truly. Happy to start, um, Anna, if that's okay. Um, I would have liked to have two hours uh, in front of us, honestly, to go into all the questions are all good. I'll try to make three points, starting with um, um, what Reza said in terms of confidence building, uh, but also the question raised by Alexandra in terms of should the common framework be more institutionalized to create precisely this confidence building? I would argue not to do that at this point in time. I think many of the questions were about, you know, what is the cutoff date that should be defined so as to incentivize new financing? What is the discount rate that is being used to assess comparability of treatment? Um, what is, um, you know, uh, the uh, credit rating agencies um, you know, approach when a country make a request. We remember Ethiopia, February 2021, Fitch uh, said the request per se is a sign of downgrade. Moody said, no, 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 I have to wait uh, uh, to assess what would be the rating application of just making the request. I have to know better what is uh, the content of the request. All of that are excellent questions. I would argue that we need to have cases and to, you know, generate by the making what should be the rules rather than having a theoretical approach, top-down approach, which would probably not fit the reality. So I think this is important to, to build this confidence that Reza rightly advocates, to at this point in time, take a step back, having the first cases unfold, and then, and then uh, at some point indeed go to some uh, institutionalization. But going too fast would just be too rigid and we'd block everything. I think that's uh, one thing I wanted to mention. Second is uh, on the Zambia case, the DSA has not been negotiated at all. DSAs are DSAs. Uh, the fact that indeed we had a second DSA went just because uh, you know the SLA was December 2021. The program went to the board in August. So we had to update the macroeconomic framework, but we don't negotiate a DSA with creators. That's just no way. <laughs> so there is no issue in terms of too little, too late. We do our job uh, and we find what is necessary in terms of debt relief according to our methodology, which has been approved by our boards, World Bank and IMF, and we don't negotiate DSA with creators. Um, and, and the last point, I think there was a question in terms of precisely what is the norms uh, do we lower the bar in terms of financing assurances provided to the funds through the common framework? I would argue exactly the opposite. I mean, if you look at what's, what was the practice under the Paris Club, basically you had a meeting, uh, you had a discussion among creators, closed door, uh, IMF and World Bank were in the room, and depending on the discussion, we said, okay, there are financing assurances. There was not even a statement. There was no thing in written from the Paris Club to provide financing assurances to the Paris Club. What we have done with Chad and Zambia is to ask the creditor committee to issue a press release. Okay, you would say the press release is quite weak, but it's based on hours of discussion, closed door, as we had in the press club, but with the top ups that we want something in written and public. So we are raising the bar. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. And I do want to flag the chicken and egg problem, right? That if we don't have, uh, the sort of Reza's incentive point, right? So on the one hand, we're committed to case by case. On the other hand, if we don't know where it goes, it's a little scary to be a case, but it is what it is. Um, so Lee, speaking of case by case um, and where it takes us, and then Reza and Elena. Yeah, um, thanks, Anna. Let me deal with the first three of the groups of questions. First, comparability. This seems to me to be a key 
issue uh, because none of the first three common framework countries have yet reached their bilateral creditor <laughs> restructuring. We haven't yet uh, ventured uh, uh, into the area of whether the commercial creditors will go gentle into the good night of giving comparable treatment to whatever the bilaterals come up with. Comparability will be assessed in net present value terms. That is how the Paris Club does it. Um, but of course, it turns, as you mentioned, critically upon the question of the discount rate. The Paris Club traditionally uses a very low discount rate, I think in part because they don't wish to advertise to their uh, taxpayers just uh, how much debt relief they have been giving. Uh, the commercial market will use uh, a much more uh, realistic uh, discount rate. Uh, and so that is going to be the key. Uh, but uh, to, to raise this point, I don't think the common framework as such is going to change at all the dynamics for holdout creditors. If holdout creditors uh, exist in the commercial creditor universe, they will have to be dealt with in the old fashioned ways, either collective action clauses or some other technique. The second issue, Anna, you raised was, uh, are we moving or continue to move toward short and shallow debt restructurings? I fear perhaps yes. If you read the common, the page and a half common framework statement, it has an ominous sentence which says that debt write offs, principal haircuts, are to be considered only in the most extreme cases. I saw Chinese fingerprints on that sentence. Um, and what it may, and there's, there's also twice, I believe, in that uh, uh, release, a statement that says it is not just the IMF's DSA that is to guide the amount of debt relief needed, the uh, countries sitting at the common framework negotiating table, uh, creditor countries must reach their own conclusion. Both of those things could suggest uh, a, a tendency toward more shallow debt relief coming out of these discussions than is perhaps needed. And that I would see as a, uh, as a real problem. Final comment, how will it change the architecture? I can't see any policy reason why a middle income country could not attempt on an ad hoc basis to replicate the common framework approach to negotiation, which is to say, to invite all of its bilateral creditors, Paris Club and non-Paris Club, to sit at the same negotiating table. Now, they would have to agree to do it, but I can't see any reason why they would not wish to do that. And Reza is absolutely right when he says that, uh, that there will not be a great temptation on the part of finance ministers to do that unless they see the common framework as both working and working expeditiously. I'll stop. Thank you very much. Now, um, we're going to go over by just a few minutes, um, but Reza, you're, you're next. And we will have a, a, a post on the um, Sovereign Debt Forum website uh, kind of with an overview of this discussion. And we invite you all to sign up and discuss and tweet at us and do everything else one does under the circumstances. Reza, your, your floor. Thank you, Anna. Really, really very rich discussion. And I apologize that I have to jump off at 10 for something that has um, to start at that time. Just two very quick comments. One is on the point regarding the holdout creditors. And Lee, I was referring more to official, bilateral official creditors getting their cooperation rather than the private creditors. And in that context, I want to be a bit clear of my own uh, uh, view, which is that for the system to be efficient, I believe that the fund needs to play a more central role 
than perhaps its shareholders are giving it right now. These policies regarding official bilateral creditors are in some sense, if you step back, about the sharing of decision-making or power in the fund's executive board versus in the capitals. And my own thinking is that for an efficient framework, it is important that finance ministers feel the confidence that once they start with the fund, the fund mission chief or the fund team will be able to deliver and will be able to get the bilateral official creditors into the same page so that the period of being shut out from the markets is as small as possible. That's really my point about trying to get using the funds tools arrears policy and others for having the right incentives. My second quick point is really a request. I think it may be useful to look at the financing assurances policy of the fund. And I understand that there have been cases, uh, whether in the context of a debt restructuring or not in the context of a debt restructuring, where bilateral official creditors have pulled out the assurances or have not delivered them in the manner in which it was indicated at the beginning of a program or at the time of the completion of a review. That's critical. And again, goes to my first point about needing to ensure that the fund is in a driving position to be able to deliver a debt treatment because the finance minister deals with the mission chief, not with the rest. And the finance minister needs to have confidence in the mission chief that a treatment will be delivered in accordance with what was thought is that DSA is pointing out. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us, knowing that constraints in particular. Um, Ellen and then Sean will um, close us out. And again, you know, watch this space. We will obviously have to have a lot more conversations about this, um, sadly, at some level. I very, very quickly, I'll just leave it with the three, I think, most most common kind of asked questions from, from the market participants around the common framework. One is relook at eligibility and a lot of middle income countries uh, are in, in distress or should that be expanded to middle income countries? The second point that comes up is around coordination, how to make sure that private sector is at the table, private sector and the borrowing country at the table along with the official sector from the beginning of the process. And then the third one is kind of acknowledge the, the third comment we hear a lot is acknowledge the total financing package. So private sector, there could be debt relief, but there's also a lot of new financing that comes from the private sector that, that should be acknowledged as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. And the terms matter, of course, but yes, yeah. thank you so much. Um, Sean, um, the grand conclusion and well, the ultimate wisdom. No, I, I'm, there's no grand conclusion and certainly no wisdom, and I will let you close out. I just wanted to make one point in light of it, what everybody has said. Clearly, the, this common framework does not operate in a vacuum. We have to look at other incentives that are in play. And um, I had mentioned the fund's lending policies, and uh, both Guillaume and Reza had mentioned them. I just want to identify that in the lending into arrears policies, there is, there is an asymmetry between the flexibility that exists on the policy with respect to private creditors and official creditors. The policy on official creditors does not have the same degree of flexibility. And it's unfortunate in a way, but that is the reality. And I agree with Guillaume, it is, it's gonna be very difficult to revisit that. It doesn't mean that there's no flexibility, but it's more limited, particularly when the official bilateral creditor is a large one. Um, so we need to bear that in mind um, when we look at the adequacy of the incentive framework that basically supports the common framework. Anna, you should close us out. Well, um, first of all, I cannot thank all of you enough. Our fabulous panelists, we could make it a four hour event, but we didn't. Um, to everyone who has stuck around and asked brilliant questions, we will try to address them in uh, the follow-on uh, posts as well as in future events. So again, Sovereign Debt Forum is, uh, alas, has a very, very busy 
uh, docket. And um, just as a substantive observation, um, it took the Paris Club from what, 1956 to the late 1980s to even consider NPV reduction, let alone stock reduction. Um, so my fear is that this is a very long road, but my hope is that there is learning that goes on along the road and that um, that will in turn um, lessen the misery and shorten the um, uh, crisis. <laughs> Thank you all so very much um, and we will see you soon.